Welcome to the Access Truth Podcast, exploring challenging issues currently impacting missions in a rapidly changing world. The Access Truth Podcast with Paul Mack. This morning or today, depending on where you're watching this in the world, I'm very privileged to be talking with Dr. Bill Bjorka. Um, so welcome to our podcast, Bill. Thank you, Paul. I'm honored to be with you okay. and hear your work there. So Dr. Bill Bjorka, as I, what I know, the, 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 the facts, you've served in uh, pastoral and teaching roles in Israel for eight years in 1980s. You're married to Diana, uh, a New Zealander, and you have right. three sons. And you okay. teach it now at William Carey, among other things, International University in uh, Judeo-Christian Contemporary Western Cultural Studies. And I know you've co-authored a book recently with Tom Steffen called The Return of Oral Hermeneutics. Right. So those are the, have I got those facts right? Yes. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Good. Now, um, on your website, you talk about growing up in the turbulent cultural revolution of the 60s and 70s as a seeker for truth. And you just, there's some uh, tantalizing hints at a story there of how you come to, came to know the Lord. I, being an advocate for the power of story, I wonder if you'd just tell us something of that story um, briefly. Sure, just briefly. I was, yeah, in the, I came of age in the late 60s in the height of the counterculture, the, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll counterculture, the Woodstock generation. You know, I came to uh, uh, age, came of age then. And after high school, I just hit the road, hitchhiking west. And I was on my way to San Francisco where, where the, there was the big hippie scene in those days. But I only got as far as Boulder, Colorado. And there was quite a scene there at the University of Colorado campus in, in the counterculture. And um, so I sort of camped there for a while in the mountains and, and got involved just as a seeker, seeking truth among the various philosophies and ways of life that were presented there. There was a whole earth fair, a, a religions fair, mostly Eastern religions were coming in to the U.S. at that time. There were the Krishna consciousness people. And then, of course, there was the drug, the LSD people. Uh, but among them were the Jesus people, the Jesus freaks, the Jesus people. Now, I'd, I'd grown up in a Baptist church, but I left, I left quite early, you know, because of the, the counterculture draw. But when I met the Jesus people there in Boulder, Colorado, they witnessed to me, and uh, I could see they had something powerful and they had been set free from drugs, and they had, uh, they had, their lives had been changed. And I, I listened and I heard what they were saying, and I just kind of hung out with them, you know, for several days. And they eventually challenged me: if you want the truth, pray to Jesus. He's alive. He's real. Pray to Jesus and ask him to show you. And I did, and they gave me a place to stay there at their hostel for a few days. And that night that I asked Jesus, if you're real, if you're alive, if you rose from the dead, show me and I'll follow you. Uh, he, his presence came into that room that night and I couldn't sleep all night because I knew he was there with me. And I was just confessing my sins and talking to him. And that was also the simultaneous call of God in my life to mission. I didn't know what it meant. At that time, I thought, am I going to be going to Africa as a mission? I didn't know, but I, I knew this was total all-out commitment to Jesus and to following him. And uh, so that was my radical new birth, born-again experience, 1970, in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, it's been 50 years now, and I, I've not looked back. I went to Bible college, and then I went to Israel for eight years, met my wife, who's a New Zealander. We were married there and ministered in discipling young Israeli believers. Um, about that time in the same movement, you know, YWAM was growing in Europe. There were YWAM bases in Europe. And a lot of young Israelis who were finishing their army service, they would travel the world for a few months, sometimes a few years, they would travel the world, Israelis, after the army. And a lot of these Israelis were 
running into YWAM bases in Europe, coming to faith in Jesus. So they were coming back to Israel as believers, looking for fellowship. And the congregation I was a part of was Beit Emanuel in Tel Aviv. We had a group of 12 or 15 young Israeli believers there when I came. And I just began to disciple them and and uh, get involved with them. And uh, I was eventually asked to be co-pastor with the, the uh, American Mennonite spirit-filled uh, pastors, missionaries who were leading this congregation. They asked me to to join them in pastoral leadership, and I eventually became the senior pastor for four years. And then we we uh, eventually transferred the leadership of the congregation, Beit Emanuel, to uh, Israeli young Israeli leaders, 1989. And that's when I we came back to the states here to Southern California, and I did a PhD, okay. first a master's and a PhD uh-huh. at Fuller Seminary. But we've continued to reach out to Jewish people ever since then. It's yeah. like a lot calling to Jewish people, uh, and right. we're still involved with them. Mm-hmm. Great. Well, it's, uh, there's a lot I'd love to hear more about in that story, and, and to be really honest, um, there's some very much some parallels in our, our stories in that uh, my friend and I ended up uh, way up in North Queensland when I was, you know, just 20, with the Jesus people of North Queensland, and they had a profound impact on us as we lived in their community. So, yeah, I think there are some parallels there in our story, but uh, we uh, we probably should move on. Um, I did want to say I didn't know much about uh, William Carey, the international university that you work with now, um, but as I was getting ready for this conversation, I did, did look at that, and... Uh, just briefly wanted to, yeah, hear a little more. Uh, founded by Ralph Winter back in 77, I, I saw, um, non-residential. And I like this part, that it approaches the liberal arts and seminary curricula within an integrated framework that it, it says that looks at God's global purposes through history. That sounds like a, a pretty noble way to approach things. Yeah, you summarize it well, Paul. Yeah, Dr. Ralph Winter, who founded the U.S. Center for World Mission here in Pasadena in the 70s, and and William Carey International University, which was part of the same effort by Dr. Winter. Um, He passed away in 2009. But yeah, the vision was for a university, not a Bible college or a Bible training institute, but a university where there's the, Mm -hmm. I believe in the integration of faith and learning, learning, learning the liberal arts, and the social sciences and the whole field of, of, of academic pursuit, but from Christian presuppositions, from a biblical worldview. And so we, we study the social sciences, you know, anthropology and the social sciences uh, and history and uh, from a, in philosophy from a biblical worldview. And um, yeah. our graduates then have a degree from a university, not a seminary, which is strategic mm-hmm. And you're sending mission agents into a, a you know restricted areas or a Muslim country or most countries today that are not that don't have the Christian history. They don't want just missionaries coming in to missionize right. and make Christians out of their people. They want they want to see that they're bringing in educated people from a university that have something to offer their people. Yeah. And so we offer so that that's been the vision. It's a it's a university. We don't we don't we don't broadly proclaim that we're Christian though we are. And though anybody wants to study out who we are, they'll see that we're Christian. So that's not the, that's not our, our, uh, the major thing flag to people. And it's worked quite well. We've got students from all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's great. Uh, those kinds of approaches are so needed in the world today, aren't they? That, uh, where Christians don't overt Christian identities don't have access into so much of the marketplace, so many communities. So yeah, I was, I was fascinated by that, but, um, moving along, um, I know that you did your PhD study and I, and I checked out your dissertation a little bit, but, uh, you focused on radical individualism in, in, you know, late modern Western culture. 
So I'm not sure if this question I wanted to pose to you relates directly to that research, but I wonder if you'd comment on how story, the oral communication of truth, um, how that plays out in our post our deconstructed, postmodern, post-truth Western world. How does story help relate to the current generation and culture? Yes, very good question. Um, I know you're you're involved, your mission and others uh, that are more directly involved with primary oral learners, semi semi literate or non literate people. But in this orality movement, which um, if you follow Tom Steffen and his work, he's he's been a pioneer in sort of uh, chronicling the movement too. Since your own father was a was a pioneer in the modern era of orality. Um, has been primarily focused on primary oral learners or semi-literate people, but we've come to see in the movement, orality movement, that this is also highly relevant to Western culture, modern Western culture, Europe and America, Australia, New Zealand as well, because it's what it's what they call secondary orality, not primary oral learners, but secondary oral learners, which has kind of come at the same time as the digital revolution, television, and then the digital yeah. revolution, computers. And so that younger people today, the millennial generation, and even the generation X and Y, but generation Z, the millennial generation in the West, their minds are also more conditioned to taking in information orally because of the computer mm -hmm. screens. Uh, they've been conditioned by television and movies and videos on the internet and through social media, which is very visual and, uh, and oral. It's audio, it's visual. And so their minds have been conditioned through that to take in information through oral means, visual and storytelling means. Uh, younger people don't read big, long books anymore. Here, I've got one right here. Big, long, thick books like this with nothing but prose. Yeah. They don't read that anymore. <laughs> they don't yeah. read. And so we're not going to reach them if, if we send them books to read, if we send them big, thick books to read. They're not going to read them. They're, they're oriented towards the um, visual and the oral. So even here in the West, um, using oral strategies of communication has become very important. It's become the most effective way to reach people uh, through short films and media yeah. to tell stories. Very good. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. <laughs> Lots we could we could pursue in that. But um, uh, I wanted to move on to your engagement with the whole uh, Jewish world in some ways. Not sure how to quite describe that, but um, I think it was in the forward to the return of our old hermeneutics, the book that you co-authored with with Tom Steffen. And we might, we'll touch on that in a little while specifically, but uh, in the forward, I think it was, uh, was it Daniel Shaw? He mentions, and I'll, I'll just read this, that your personal interaction with Jewish people around the world enabled you to recognize how orality and textuality combine to help appreciate a long Talmudic tradition that values story and uh, it's telling story. So could you just elaborate a little on that? I, I found that fascinating. Yeah, my life calling is to Jewish people. It has been for uh, over 40 years. Um, spent eight years in Israel, learned modern Hebrew, and know the Jewish culture, Jewish history. So what happened was, uh, after I finished seminary, I had an office here uh, at the U.S. Center for World Mission, Pasadena, California. And um, Larry Dinkins, who's a veteran OMF missionary, Overseas Mission Fellowship in Thailand. Mm -hmm. He'd been in Thailand for nearly 30 years. He came here to Pasadena and got an office next to mine because his wife had come, come down with cancer and they came here to Pasadena so he could get treatment at the City of Hope a Medical Hospital here in Pasadena. So he had an office next to mine. We got to talking and he was telling me how that he how that learning storytelling had revolutionized his ministry in Thailand, and uh, you know he had he had gone the whole route of higher theological education, got a PhD at Talbot 
here in Southern Cal, Talbot, Biola. Biola University is where Tom Steffen was professor, mm-hmm. Talbot at the seminary there. So Larry got a PhD there, and he felt he was really highly trained and well-equipped to go to Thailand as a missionary and teach them theology. But because he was trained in the Western seminary approach, he, um, he was oriented towards giving lectures, you know, with outlines mm-hmm. and bullet points and, and big words and uh, highly abstracted uh, theology. And he found that the Thai people, just their eyes just kind of glazed over like they didn't really get it, you know. And he just was frustrated. Well, he came here to, to Pasadena on furlough then with his wife, and he took a storytelling workshop up in Hemet, uh, led by Dorothy Miller. She's with the Lord now. But, um, and he went back to Thailand uh, on break while his wife was still here and began to use storytelling with the Thai people. Uh, and it just completely, a completely different response. The people loved it. They got engaged. They wanted to hear more stories. They were learning the Bible. They were telling each other stories. And he was telling me this as he was next to me in my office. And I said, oh, that's, mm-hmm. that's great, Larry. You work with Thai people. They're oral learners. They're semi-literate. They're oral learners. But I work with Jewish people. And Jewish people are highly literate. Jewish people are called mm-hmm. the people of the book. You know, right. Jewish people are, are the people of the book. They're, they're not going to hear this stuff that's for this storytelling. It's for semi-literate yeah. people or for children's ministry. Often storytelling is thought right. it's for right. children. But, but then I, I didn't think about it too long until I realized that, hey, the stories of the Old Testament are the stories of the Jewish people. Mm-hmm. And even... Modern Jewish people are quite illiterate in the Bible, really. They don't know the Bible that well, their own heritage. But they still know that the stories of the Old Testament, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David, these are the stories of their people. So they're not going to be threatened by these stories. They're they're Jewish-friendly stories. And so telling these stories, but telling them as a believer in Jesus, most of these stories point somehow to Jesus, you know? You can, you, can, you can usually point these stories to Jesus, the, the prophetic sure. foreshadowings and types of Christ in the story. So I thought, well, and I was leading a weekly Jewish Seekers Bible study then. I thought, well, I'm going to try this. So I took the workshop, learned how to do storytelling, and I began to do it, to use it in my storytelling group, Jewish Seekers Bible study, where I had been giving lectures. I began storytelling, did, it, did one story every night, and the people loved it. Uh, About a half to a third of the group were Jewish. They loved it. They were responding to it. We would discuss a story about two hours. One story, we'd discuss it for about two hours every week. And so I realized that, hey, stories are for everybody. Everybody loves stories. Uh, Everybody's hardwired for stories. Somebody once said, we don't dream in bullet points. We dream in stories. Everybody's hardwired for stories. Life is a story. The Bible is a story. Mm. Jesus used stories. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, And so my great discovery was that this works for everybody, no matter what the level, for Western-educated people, Western millennial younger generation, or highly educated Jewish people. Everybody, every people group, every civilization has had their storytellers. And uh, so that was my discovery there. That's great. Yeah. Well, it's... I mean, as you've already alluded to, the the Bible is, the Torah is the story of the Messiah, really, isn't it? And uh, we are, we're wired for story and we're called as his witnesses to be those who tell his grand story. So that's great. We'll be right back in just a moment. But first, here's a free resource from accesstruth.com. You know, in John 21, following the resurrection, Jesus talks to Peter and three times he says, do you love me? Three times Peter answers with the familiar statement, you know I'm fond of you. And each time Jesus says the same thing. He says, then feed or tend my sheep. And that is what you and I as pastors are entrusted to do. We do not preach because we think we have something to say. We preach because we as pastors, as shepherds, are commanded 
in the Word of God that that is what we're to do. He says, I want you to preach the Word. Timothy's not to preach his ideas, but God's. Paul doesn't tell him, Timothy, I want you to tell emotional stories. I want you to try to move people or share deep thoughts. I want you to talk about the world today. He says, I want you to preach the very words of God. The thing that makes preaching unique is its divine content. Preaching is primarily about God's word reaching men and women's ears and ultimately impacting their hearts. Preaching the word is meant to change people's lives. These sessions are designed to give you tools that will help you better observe, study, and preach the texts of epistles and of narratives. The first four sessions, we tried to create a value for and an understanding of expository preaching. We tried to define it and to give you a model that you could follow in your weekly preparation. The middle four sessions were dedicated to the expository study and preaching of epistolary literature in our New Testament. Our last major section on how to study and preach narrative literature. And we want to become proficient in handling these tools so that we can put the ingredients of Scripture together so that we might serve our people uh, meals that would lead to health and growth in their lives. And now back to the Access Truth Podcast with Paul Mack. I guess over the years you've observed, you know, many different approaches to reaching the Jews. And uh, I use quotation marks in saying that, but um, based on your, uh, as well as what you've talked about of, of actually sharing truth in the form of the story, the great story and the stories of the Bible, but what are some of the other things that come to mind, Bill, that you feel are the hallmarks of the way that, you know, the God of Abraham and Isaac and, and Jacob and the father of Jesus, Yeshua, how would he want his new covenant believers to relate to, you know, his chosen people, the Jews? Uh, like, what are the, what are the, I mean, I'll say that in looking at your website, I saw a lot of respect and appreciation. Uh, I, I imagine those are some of the things that you feel are important without putting words in your mouth there. Yeah, very much so. I mean, uh, this now you're getting to the heart of my own uh, calling in theology to the Jewish people. Um, yeah. The Apostle Paul, he was, a, he was called to the Gentiles. He was the Apostle to the Gentiles. But he never lost his deep love for his own Jewish people. And he struggled with the mystery. How is it that God's chosen people, the elect people, the children of Abraham of the covenant, that most of them, most of them rejected their Messiah when he came? He struggled with that. We call it the mystery of Israel, the church. And so by the time he wrote, by the time he wrote the book of Romans, probably 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus, maybe 40 years after the resurrection of Jesus. And Paul had been in ministry that time by, by that time, a long time, 20 years or more. He writes the book of Romans. When, when you get to Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, he addresses, he's finally gotten the revelation from God about the mystery of Israel and the church. And in those chapters, he talks about how, you know, the, the metaphor of the olive tree, the people of God are the, the olive tree, the roots the, the roots and the trunk of the olive tree are Israel, the Jewish people, and the branches grew. And he says that we, the Gentile, you who are born Gentiles, he said, we are, we are Gentiles, Paul wasn't, but he said, the Gentiles are like wild olive branches that were grafted in when the natural branches, the Jews were broken off. Those who rejected Jesus were broken off the natural branches, the wild olive branches, which are the Gentiles were grafted in. So we've been grafted into Israel. We've been grafted into Israel's trunk and roots. We've been grafted into Israel's story. So Israel's story is our story. And so the Jewish people are our brothers and sisters. They're our ancestors. They're not truly our spiritual brothers and sisters until they embrace Messiah. But there's that affinity 
with Israel, the Jewish people, that the church should always feel, because Paul says, Paul says, remember, you don't support the root. The root supports you. The root of Israel, the Jewish people, the Old Testament, three-fourths of the Bible is the Old Testament. And the whole Bible has been written by Jewish people. One possible exception is Luke. For, for most of Christian history, people have thought that Luke was, was probably a Gentile. But there's been a recent strong study and case for the fact that Luke also was Jewish. I can give you the link to the book on that if you like. But most likely, I think that, that Luke also was Jewish. If that's the case, then every book of the New Testament was also written by a Jewish person, Jewish apostles. So the Bible is a Jewish book. And so we owe this gratitude to the Jewish people, not only for our Savior, the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, but for the scriptures. And the fact that most of them are still away from God now, they've been, Paul said, they've been blinded, uh, judiciously blinded in part. They have a veil in part uh, so that they can't receive the Messiah. But that veil is lifted when they turn to the Lord. And so the church's mandate has always been to reach out to the Jewish people. And Paul says there in chapter 11 of Romans, he said that we might provoke the Jewish people to jealousy by showing them that we know their own God, the God of Israel, better than they do because we've embraced their Messiah, Jesus. We know their God better than they do and to make them jealous and thereby win them to faith in their own Messiah. And so to do that, we, have, we yeah. need to cross the barriers that have been built by Christian history and Christian anti-Semitism and uh, reach across and show them that we love them and that Jesus is Jewish and that to believe in Jesus is a very Jewish thing to do and that when they embrace mm -hmm. Jesus, they're not embracing a new religion. They're embracing their own roots of their own religion, their own Messiah. They're not converting and that they can live out their lives as Jews, Messianic Jews. That's the Messianic Jewish movement in faith in Jesus. Yeah. And so that's that's been my calling. That's mm -hmm. the theology that I, I wish to communicate to the church whenever I can. It's basically a study of Romans 9, 10, and 11. Uh, and I think, I think the truth of those chapters have been veiled to many in the church for centuries. Uh, but really, that's the climax of the book of Romans. The book of Romans builds up yeah. to this climax of 9, 10, and 11, but because by the end of Romans 11, Paul gives this doxology, oh, the, oh, the riches and depths of the wisdom and knowledge of God, that he has, he has uh, brought both Israel and the Gentiles under sin, so that both need faith, both need each other. Uh, the church needs Israel and the Jewish people to realize who they are, their roots, their identity. But Israel now, the Jewish people, need the church to show them mm -hmm. the Messiah. So, so right. there, there's, there's this interdependence, both under sin, both needing Jesus, and both needing each other to come together in one new humanity, the one new humanity of Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah. And so mm -hmm. yeah, that's kind of the essence of my, my heart. For the, for <laughs> no, the, that's... That's a compelling picture that you uh, you paint there, Bill. And I can see that um, you don't just hold these things as academic truths, but they're uh, they're uh, really you're hot in it. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, and you know that is the story, isn't it? It's not just some theoretical propositional points from romans but that's part of the flow of the whole narrative of what god's doing i did want to just finish up briefly with touching on the return of oral hermeneutics and it has the secondary title of as good today as it was for the hebrew bible and first century christianity um I, I've already chatted with Tom Stephan in this series of interviews about the book, so we won't go into it in depth, but uh, how did the collaboration come about, Bill, with you and, and Tom? Well, we live, we live in Southern California, both of us. I live in Pasadena, and he lived down in uh, uh, La Mirada, where Biola University is, because he's a professor for 20 years in, mm -hmm. in, at Biola. 
And so we were nearby. And so he, uh, <clears throat> he asked me to come down and teach one of his courses because he had one year he had a course that was too big to teach. He had 70 students in one course. And so he split it in two and asked me to come down and teach. So I got to know him. That was 2005, I think. But then in uh, the summer of 20, 2018, he was, he had by that time really come into orality and, and storytelling. And so he was teaching a summer course in orality and storytelling. He asked me to come down and be a guest storyteller, which I had come into by that time. <clears throat> so I came down and I told the story of Naaman, the, Seer, the Syrian leper. Mm -hmm. Naaman, the Syrian leper who was healed through Elisha's ministry. Told that story and discussed it, simply the story style. And it was just such a, such a dynamic class. I mean, people were just, we couldn't stop discussing it. Insights and revelations. <laughs> I mean, we talked about that story for probably way over an hour. We had to break. <laughs> uh -huh. And so Tom got to know, he said, hey, let's write a book together. <laughs> I can see you've got, some, you've got some skills I don't have. He was stronger on some of the theory. This, the yeah. center part of the book the, the book is it's bookended by the first two chapters are a story, like a transcript of a storytelling event, and then another chapter mm -hmm. reflecting on that. It, that's how it opens. That's the opening bookend. And at mm -hmm. the end of the book is the other bookend where I tell another story, which is actually the story of Nam and the Syrian that I told for Tom, telling that story and okay. then reflecting on it. So that's the two bookends that gives honor to the storytelling. But in the center are five chapters on more the theoretical, the theoretical uh, thinking behind orality and storytelling, why storytelling works, um, the place of orality in the formation of the canon, and then the place of orality in Hebrew hermeneutics, the place of storytelling in Jewish uh, tradition and in Jewish hermeneutics and, and in Israel, uh, and you come to see how, how much orality was a part of the formation of the Bible, the text of the Bible. It was all these were, were story. The Bible were the, the stories of the Bible and the text of the Bible was, was told orally before it was ever written down. And so the, so much of the, much of the text of the Bible has this oral flavor to it, this oral atmosphere to it. So the middle part of the book talks about those theoretical dimensions, plus the issue of questioning Questioning our questions, how to ask good questions. Questions are what brings the story to life. You tell a story, then you've got to ask good yeah. questions to, to dig out the truths of the story and see what's in that story. Um, and then yeah. also the issue of um, character theology. Tom writes a strong mm -hmm. chapter on character theology that how we can, instead of focusing on systematic theology and drawing out propositions, we look at the characters. These characters, these personalities are in the Bible because God inspired them to be in there, uh, the record of their lives. And so their lives have deep lessons if we just ask the right questions of those characters and identify with those characters. And so the character yeah. theology. So that, that's kind of how the book runs. It's you, the, the two bookends are more orally oriented. Uh, in fact, I had one reviewer who was, one person who read the book who wasn't wasn't very highly educated, she thought, oh, man, the first part, the story is great, and the last part, <laughs> the story is great, but all that stuff in between, <laughs> I can't understand it. <laughs> so it's, it's got both both uh, the theory in the middle, but it's got yeah. its book ended by storytelling. Sure. Well, as I said to Tom, I'm sure the irony didn't escape you guys of writing a a fairly academic book in parts, as you say, about orality. Like there's some kind of anomaly there, but you've done the very best you can by actually putting a record of a storytelling event and how to relate to that. So I could see how you were trying to balance those two things. So, well, I guess we need to wrap it up, whereas uh, we could talk for a very long time about some of these fascinating things and yeah, I just I just appreciate your passion for the the things that uh, you've been sharing, Bill. But um, just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity to get to know you a little and your story and uh, hearing the things that you're involved in. And yeah, very much appreciate 
uh, the opportunity to talk today. Well, thank you, Paul. It was great to meet you, and okay. I feel honored uh, yeah. at your interest and and that uh, your colleagueship and mm-hmm. in, in in our calling. Uh, yeah, to fulfill the Great Commission. Thank you. Bless you. Okay. Thank you.